G'day. One learns in calculus there's a very fundamental number called E. E which has a value about 2.7, 1H28, 1H28, 45, 90, 45 and so on and so on. Why well, have that memorized or do not know but there it is. It's a number between 2 and 3. But it has this incredible property. It actually makes differentiating exponential functions ridiculously easy. For example, I actually use E as the base of an exponential function and say, what is the derivative of that thing, James? Then I say, well, it's actually pretty darn easy. It's the simplest thing possible. It's back to being itself again. The derivative of e to the x is just 1 times e to the x, back to being itself. Incredible, actually. So that actually makes all differentiation of exponential functions so much easier in calculus. Um, you can do variations of this. For example, if I looked at e to the 2x and asked for its derivative, we say to yourself, well, okay, that's really just this exponential function with an inside that's been changed to 2x. So I guess I need the chain rule. The derivative of the basic exponential function is basically itself, e to the 2x, but then times the derivative of what's inside, times 2. So I get 2 times e to the 2x as the derivative there. Um, in general, the derivative of e to the kx, some number k, would actually be, let's work it out, it's basically the derivative of e to the something, is itself, e to itself, chain rule says times the derivative of what's inside, I get k times e to the kx, k times itself. Which actually means, if you're actually studying differential equations, rather than start with the function first and find its derivative, they ask, oh, I'll tell you what the derivative is, can you find the function? For example, if I asked, please solve dy dx is k times itself, well, we just wrote down an answer. It's actually going to be y must be e to the kx. Well, okay, that's an answer. Actually, there's many, many answers. Um, if I actually could multiply, I could actually multiply this by another constant. For example, I could do a times e to the kx. In fact, check. The derivative of this would be uh, a goes along for the right, e to the kx times the derivative of what's inside, k. Oh, yeah, it is indeed k times itself. So there are actually infinitely many answers. You can put different constants in front of this function. But the way to pin down an answer is say, no, 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 let me give you more information. I also want at x equals 0, y to have the value 1. Let me give you an initial condition. So if you looked at, look at the general solution, a e to the kx, what does the initial condition tell me? Well, when x is 0, I want y to be 1. 1 to equal a e to the k 0. K times 0 is 0, e to the 0 is 1, that's just a times 1, oh, a better be 1, so actually my solution is now unique, it must be that particular solution. In fact, you can prove in a differential equations course that simple equations like these, given an initial condition, will have a solution, well, there it is, and not only that, that solution must be unique. Differential equations of this form definitely have unique solutions, and now we can identify what they are. All right. But then, this fellow, Leonard Euler, back in the 1700s, said, that's curious, let's play with that. Who said k has to be a nice number like 2 or 3? It could be a fraction, could be a real number, could be an irrational number. What if it's a complex number? What if it's imaginary? For example, if I take this theory that says these equations have unique solutions, if you give an initial condition, then play with this one. Find a function whose derivative is i times itself with the initial condition again that y at x equals 0 must be 1. Will that have a solution? Well, if you play with that, if you just start playing with imaginary numbers here, say, OK, OK, I see that. I can see right away y must be e to the i x. There's the unique solution. Voila. If you believe the theory is still holding uh, for complex numbers, that there's, the differential equations have unique solutions, well, bingo, that's what it have to be. But he said, but actually, there's another solution to that one. Look at this. What well, if I told you, thought, thought about y equals cos x plus i side of x? Look at that. That's kind of cool. I claim it fits this equation. Take its derivative. Derivative of cos x is negative sine of x. Plus i times the derivative of sine x, cos of x. Okay. Uh, what do I do now? Well, that negative 1. Remember, i is that special number that i squared equals negative 1. So that negative 1 is really i squared times sine of x plus i times cos of x. So I actually got a common factor of i. Let me pull it out. It's i times sine of x plus uh, cos of x. So actually, this is i times, that's the original function. Bingo. Bingo. It works. Moreover, it satisfies the initial condition. When, y, when x is 0, y would be cosine of 0, which is 1, plus i times sine of 0, which is 0. 1 plus i 0 is 1. Bingo. So he said, oh, oh, so if our theory of different equations still holds, even in the complex number realm, then solutions must be unique. Ah, that must be the same as that. They must be the same thing. And voila, we've just discovered Euler's formula for trigonometry. 
e to the i x must be cosine of x plus i sine of x. Whoa, whoa. Now, all of you actually go through quite this approach to get to it. He did use calculus, he actually used more advanced calculus, Taylor series, to get to this idea. But he did the same reasoning. He said, well, if this is working for real numbers, then it should work for complex numbers too. And voila, looks what pops out. This pops out. Amazing, amazing. And I love this formula very much because I remember as a student going through my high school days having to memorize awful, awful trigonometric formulas. Uh, the addition of two angles formula, the double angle formula, all those things with sines and cosines and stuff. Oh, horrible, horrible. But here's the amazing thing. What Orgula formula says is actually all of trigonometry, all the sine cosine stuff is actually encoded as exponents of E. Everything's really about exponents of that magic number E. All trigonometry is hidden in that. All those formulas I had to memorize are actually in that. Now, I don't memorize anything, but I'm going to write down right now, because I'm going to see it in my mind's eye, a formula for the uh, uh, angle sum formula for sine. Now, in my mind's eye, I can see it. Don't have it memorized. I'm actually doing it right now. I'm seeing something right in my mind right now. It must be sine x plus cos y plus uh, cos x sine y. Whoa. Now, I'm not a fellow that likes to memorize, and that was not memorized. Okay, let's see if I'm right. What did I do? What did I do in my mind's eye just then? Well, I used this. I used this formula. Because I realized that really sine of x plus y is actually part of e to the i, or I guess it's x plus y now. So I was really thinking of i, e to the i, x plus y. I guess I want the input x plus y everywhere. And I said, okay, well, all this formula says that is, okay, e to the i something is cosine of the something, x plus y, plus i sine of the something, x plus y. Bingo. But basic exponents rules, this is lovely. Exponent rules tell me, oh, no, no, this is really just e to the i, x plus i, y. It's really I, e to the i, x times e to the i, y. Because that's how exponents work, basic exponent rules. Fabulous. What I love about that, well, e to the i, x is its own little formula. It is cos x plus i sine of x times uh, e to the i, y, its own little formula. Cos y plus i sine of y. Beautiful, there it is. And now it seems irresistible to actually expand those brackets. Let me do it. I get cos x cos y, cos x cos y. And I get i sine x cos y, i sine x cos y. And I get uh, i uh, cos x sine y, i cos x sine y. And I get i sine x times i sine y, i squared is negative one, so I get minus sine x sine y. Beautiful. But look, I've got this formula, and I've got this formula, and they're both the same thing by the basic exponent laws. So let me look at the i part. Oh, the i part of this formula is just sine of x plus y. That's what I wanted. And it must equal the i part of this formula, which is uh, sine x cos y and plus a cos x sine y. Did I do it right? Sine x cos y plus a cos x sine y. Beautiful. There it is. In fact, as a bonus, I can see right now from my formula, cos of x plus y must be the non-i part. There's the non-i part. Must match this non-i part cos of x, cos of y, minus sine x, sine, minus sine of y. Bingo, and I bet that's the formula I was memorizing as a kid. Whoa, whoa. So I bet now you could work out all the double angle formulas. I mean, look at e to the i, 2x. That is really just e to the i, x squared by basic exponent laws. I bet you can now do triple angle formulas. i to 3x will just be take e to the i, x, take this formula and cube it. I bet you'll come out with triple angle formulas. I bet you can do the subtraction formulas. I bet you can do them all now. Here's the magic thing about Euler's formula. It encodes trigonometry. When people ask me, what's the real world application of complex numbers? Actually, it's this. It's actually this. Any field that has to work with trigonometry is so much easier if you actually don't think of sines and cosines separately. Think of them as combined, as use the, uh, as, as e to the i x's. Bingo, use Euler's formula. And then all the mathematics of trigonometry is really encoded in just basic power rules. That makes life so much easier. Any mathematics you're studying, be electrical engineering of sine waves and cosine waves, please think of complex numbers, your maths will be so much easier. That's the practical real world application of complex numbers. The biggest one that comes to my mind right off the bat, because this is truly, truly magical and inspiring and beautiful beyond belief.